Hello viewers, I am Dr. Ravir. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Hereditary Spherocytosis Part 1. This video will contain introduction to this disorder followed by brief discussion about its definition, pathogenesis and morphology. Then in the second part of this series we will finish our discussion by talking about the clinical features, diagnosis and management of this disorder. Okay, a lot of topics so let's begin. First question, what do we mean by hereditary spherocytosis? Now, before telling you the definition of this disorder, let's talk about some facts that will help us in understanding the definition. The first thing that we have to remember is hereditary spherocytosis is a hereditary disorder of red blood cell membrane. So that one was easy. We can remember that it is a hereditary disorder because it is written in the name. Hereditary spherocytosis, it is a hereditary disorder and it is involving the red blood cell membrane. The second thing that we have to remember is that this disorder is caused by intrinsic defects in the red blood cells membrane is skeleton. The third thing that we have to remember is in this disorder due to the intrinsic defects in the red blood cells membrane is skeleton the affected red blood cells lose their normal biconcave circular disc shape and they become spheroidal. Those cells are called spherocytes. However, hereditary spherocytosis is not the only cause of spherocytosis. We can see spherocytes in some other diseases too, as we will later see. The fourth point that we have to remember is that these spherocytes are more rigid and less deformable when we are comparing them with normal biconcave circular disc shaped red blood cells and that will have some problems for the spherocytes. These rigid and less deformable spherocytes when they are passing through the splenic circulation may become entrapped in the splenic circulation and they will be vulnerable to destruction by the splenic macrophages. So now that we have talked about some basic facts regarding hereditary spherocytosis, now we are ready to define this disorder. Okay, I hope you are still with me. You didn't run away just like my students do when I try to teach them definitions of pathology. I even have to show them teddy bears to keep them calm. So look, I am also showing you a teddy. So look at the teddy, don't run away because if you had listened to the facts that I had just mentioned, I am sure you will understand the definition clearly. Okay, so according to your textbook, hereditary spherocytosis can be defined as a hereditary disorder caused by intrinsic defects in the red cell membrane skeleton that render red cells spheroid, less deformable and vulnerable to splenic sequestration and destruction. So that was the definition of hereditary spherocytosis. So now that we have defined this disorder, now we will move on and talk about the prevalence of this disorder. Now, the prevalence of this disorder is highest among Northern Europeans. As a matter of fact, this disorder is the most common cause of hereditary hemolytic anemia among Northern Europeans. And the prevalence rate is 1 in about 
5,000 individuals in Northern Europe. In 75% of the cases, autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance is seen. In the remainder of the cases, the disease is caused by inheritance of two different defects. Such state is also known as compound heterozygosity and individuals with such compound heterozygosity will show more severe form of the disease. So now that we have talked about the prevalence of this disorder, now we will move on and talk about the pathogenesis. Always remember, hereditary spherocytosis occurs due to defects in proteins that are involved in vertical interactions between the cell membrane and the underlying membrane skeleton of red blood cell. So in order to understand the pathogenesis, first we should have idea about the structure of a normal red blood cell membrane. So as you can see in the whiteboard, I have drawn a simple image that is showing the structure of a normal red blood cell membrane. Always remember, a normal red blood cell membrane comprises lipid bilayer, various types of proteins, and also beneath the lipid bilayer, there will be a membrane a skeleton. Now, if we focus on the membrane skeleton, we can see that the major component of the membrane skeleton is spectrin. Again, spectrin will have two types of chains. So there will be alpha chain and there will be beta chain of spectrin and they are intertwined with each other and by doing so, they are forming helical heterodimers, okay? So we are calling them heterodimers because they have two chains and those chains are not similar. Again, each spectrin heterodimer will have a head region and a tail region. Again, the head regions of spectrin heterodimers will self-associate with each other and that will result in formation of tetramers. Let me explain. Suppose this is a spectrin heterodimer, this is the head region and this is the tail region of that spectrin heterodimer. And also let's assume that this is another spectrin heterodimer and these are the head regions. So we can see that here is head-to-head -head association and that is resulting in formation of tetramer. So what is happening in the tail region? The tail regions are again associated with actin oligomer. Each actin oligomer can bind with multiple tails. So the thing we are seeing here is that spectrin and actin through their association is forming a two-dimensional spectrin actin skeleton and its function is to preserve the biconcave circular disc shape of the normal red blood cell. In order to do so, this skeleton should be attached with the lipid bilayer and we can also see that it is attached with the lipid bilayer by two distinct types of interactions. One interaction is happening near the head region, the other type of interaction is happening near the tail region. So let's talk about these two interactions now. So we can see that near the head region, spectrin is bound with the lipid bilayer with the help of another protein that is called anchirin and also with the help of band 4.2 protein. So all these proteins are helping the spectrin to bind with a protein in the lipid bilayer and that protein is called band 3. This is a transmembrane 
ion transporter protein located in the lipid bilayer. Okay, so this is one interaction. The second interaction is happening near the tail region. Here we can see that the spectrin actin skeleton is bound with the lipid bilayer with the help of the protein 4.1 that is helping this spectrin actin skeleton to bind with the protein glycophorin. So, hereditary spherocytosis will happen when there is some problem in these vertical interactions. So, it is happening due to various types of mutations. Most of the mutations will result in frame shift or sometimes they will also result in formation of stop codons. And recall from your genetics classes that whenever the stop codon is produced, the affected gene will no longer make the particular protein. So, most commonly, anchorin is affected other proteins like band 4.2, spectrin, band 3, these will also be affected in many cases. Okay, so always remember that anchorin, band 4.2, band 3, spectrin, these various proteins may be affected due to various types of mutations. So whenever these proteins are affected, what will happen? that will result in insufficiency of the membrane skeleton. It won't be functioning properly. And as a result of that insufficiency, there will be destabilization of the lipid bilayer. And ultimately, the destabilized lipid bilayer will begin to shed membrane fragments. So there will be loss of membrane fragments. The surface to volume ratio of the red blood cell will begin to decrease and ultimately the normal biconcave circular disc shape red blood cell will become spheroidal. Okay, now what will happen next? So this is an image of a normal biconcave circular disc shape RBC viewed from the side and this is the same RBC viewed from the top. Note that there was a central paler when we are looking at the red blood cell from the top. But when that thing is becoming spherocyte, you can see that the biconcave circular disc shape is now lost and the central paler is also lost. So what will happen next? Now always remember, spherocytes are less deformable and more rigid when compared to a normal biconcave circular disc shape red blood cell. So these spherocytes, when they are passing through the splenic circulation, they will become trapped in the splenic cords and they will become easy prey for the splenic macrophages. Again, when the spherocytes are trapped inside the splenic cords for a prolonged duration of time, which may even be as long as 10 hours, there will be some other abnormalities in them. The glucose level inside the red blood cell, inside the spherocyte will be reduced. The pH will be also reduced. There will be problem in their membrane permeability. And as a result of that, there will be also loss of potassium and water from the affected spherocytes. And all these things will further complicate the problem. So ultimately, these spherocytes will die prematurely and they will be phagocytosed by the splenic macrophages. And all these things will lead to hemolytic anemia. So that was, in short, regarding the pathogenesis of hereditary spherocytosis. So now that we have talked about the pathogenesis, now we will move on and talk about the morphology of this disorder. Now, the most common morphologic finding in hereditary spherocytosis will be the presence of spherocytes in the peripheral blood film. 
spherocytes are smaller than normal red blood cells and they will lack the central zone of paler. For example, in this image you can see that I have drawn normal red blood cell on the left side and you can see that in case of a normal red blood cell we have the central zone of paler okay so the central one third is pale now compare this cell with this cell this is a spherocyte and you can see that the central zone of paler is absent and it is also smaller when compared to a normal red blood cell okay so that's how we will identify a spherocyte it will be smaller than a normal red blood cell and the central zone of paler will be absent and the spherocyte will be also hyperchromic now besides the presence of spherocyte what will be the other morphological findings in a case of hereditary spherocytosis? Since this is a type of hemolytic anemia, so we will also find the common features of hemolysis. So, in the bone marrow, there will be erythroid hyperplasia, and that is happening because bone marrow is trying to compensate the hemolysis okay so there will be erythroid hyperplasia in the bone marrow there will be reticulocytosis the reticulocyte count will be elevated and that is common for all cases of hemolytic anemia similarly there will be hemosiderosis there may be presence of pigment gallstone in 40 to 50 percent of the affected adults what will be the other morphological findings in case of hereditary spherocytosis? There may be moderate splenomegaly. Now, why will the spleen become enlarged? Splenomegaly will happen due to congestion in the cord of Billroth and also due to increased proliferation of the splenic phagocytes. So this concludes part one of this series. I will hopefully upload the second part within a week where we will finish our discussion by talking about the clinical features, diagnosis and management of this disorder. Okay, so that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.